perfect day at the beach. The sun, the sand, the surf, all working together to create a sensory feast. But what we don't see are all the technologies that help us interact with this unique environment. The swimsuit we wear, the sunscreen we apply, the cooler that holds our drinks, even the surfboard that lets us skate around on the waves. All these and so much more are made possible by technological innovation. But as for the natural stuff, the fresh ocean breezes, the roar of the breakers, the feel of sand warmed by the sun, we know there'll never be a substitute for them, right? Think again. Welcome to the Ocean Dome. With a capacity of 10,000 visitors, it is the world's largest indoor artificial beach. Completed in 1993, the Ocean Dome is part of a sprawling Japanese resort called Sigaya, located in Miyazaki, Japan. Though it lies a mere quarter mile from a real beach, the Ocean Dome is a totally fabricated environment. Everything's very controlled, and what they are interacting with is really technology. Instead of real sand, its 30,000 square foot beach, called Sugar Beach, is made up of over 600 tons of crushed white marble imported from China. The sand acts as a filter, letting the water seep through into a massive reservoir beneath. But don't expect seawater in here. The Ocean Dome's 2 million plus gallons are chlorinated, salt-free, and kept at a constant 86 degrees. A really fine virtual resort. So you can always keep the water the right temperature, you can have no waves or big waves. A computer-controlled system produces cookie-cutter waves big enough to surf on. Ten vacuum pumps pull the water into 20 large chambers, where it then gets released, creating up to eight-foot-high waves. And there's never any worry about sunburn. That is, until they open up the roof. Enormous motors drive apart the four arched panels of the 2,800-ton roof, which takes only 10 minutes to open completely. They do everything with technology. And I think that probably many people like the cleanliness of it. Gentle breezes are produced by fans. The sound of seagulls comes from a recording. But these predictable pleasures may not be everybody's idea of the perfect day at the beach. Still, Sigaya stands as the culmination of a beach technology going back to ancient Rome. At the height of Imperial Rome, the Romans colonized the shores of the Mediterranean with sumptuous villas, with palaces and swimming pools, which they built along the coast. So they were filled with tidal waters, always fresh water. In the first century AD, the emperor Tiberius built his villa in Spurlonga with an enormous cave-like grotto that had pools and fish ponds fed by the ocean. For the ancient Romans, the beach was a place of unbridled luxury. The beach culture of the Romans was very hedonistic. There were resorts where spectacular beach events were staged. Swimming girls would cavort in pools. People came to have affairs. When Rome would fall, the idea of the beach as a happy place would fall with it. In the Middle Ages, many believed that exposure to water would leave them vulnerable to the plague. Then, in the 18th century, people came to believe that a practice called medicinal dunking could cure everything from depression to leprosy. A person was carried out to the water in a strange contraption called a bathing machine. 
It was a wooden cabin on wheels that was drawn into the surf by a horse, attended by a bather, a matron, or a man. And the patient would get up into the bathing machine and then emerge in the water uh, and be dunked and held underwater uh, for almost a minute and then brought up sputtering. And you'd think their normal reaction would be to escape immediately and by swimming away. The only problem was that at that time, hardly anyone knew how to swim. To learn how to swim, people in the 19th century turned to technology, everything from a simple harness to elaborate systems of plates and fins. As more people learned to swim, the more they visited the beach. By the mid to late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution swept America, and people were discovering the beach in great numbers. They would work horrendous hours, but they had a little block of time that they began to call their leisure time. And some entrepreneurs were very eager to fill that time for these people who had nothing to do. And it just happened that there was a group of developers who had discovered this forsaken island uh, off the coast of New Jersey, which soon became Atlantic City. A new railroad would soon deliver millions to the New Jersey beach town. Merchants quickly set up shop. In 1870, a legend appeared, America's first boardwalk. The celebrated boardwalk was really a commercially motivated structure. The merchants didn't want sand in their establishments, and so they bankrolled the construction of the boardwalk. Made of planks of southern pine, Atlantic City's original boardwalk cost only $5,000 and was only 10 feet wide. But as the town grew, so did its boardwalk. It was elevated higher and restructured to withstand the weight of hundreds of thousands. By the early decades of the 20th century, it had grown into a cultural and commercial phenomenon. With its huge amusement piers and unique rolling chairs, it was the place to go and the place to be seen. Today, the boardwalk is up to 60 feet wide and four miles long. Its surface is mostly made of a strong tropical hardwood called ipe and is permanently anchored into a concrete substructure. Atlantic City and its boardwalk are more popular than ever as over 37 million tourists annually pay a visit to the birthplace of modern American beach culture. The modern beach is a destination for fun and sport. But throughout history, the shore has also been a significant gateway, a place for discovery. And nowhere was this more true than on the beaches of the New World. The beach for the explorers was a site of triumph. Columbus first glimpsed the possibilities of a new world on the shores of the islands on the far reaches of the Caribbean and planted his flags there. Columbus and others like him saw an alien world with exotic cultures and untold resources. After years of struggle, they conquered this world, then realized they had to defend it from those who would take it from them. To protect their growing colonies, they built forts and outposts up and down the coast. One of the greatest was the massive Castillo de San Marcos, the oldest fortress in America. The Spanish began building it in 1672 in what is now St. Augustine, Florida. When the castle was completed 23 years later, it was an awesome accomplishment. The 33-foot-high walls were built of mortar and a local stone called coquina, which is made up of billions of fossilized sea creatures. Made of the ocean itself, the massive 12-foot-thick walls were able to absorb repeated volleys of enemy cannonballs. In its 205-year history, the old castle on the beach never once fell in battle. 
fortress is built for two reasons. One is that it, it is there to actually defend against any attack that might come on. On the other hand, it, you could also construct a fortification so that it would intimidate any enemy from ever attacking it. That was the idea behind the most extensive beach fortification in history, Hitler's Atlantic Wall. After occupying France in 1940, the Nazis realized that the English Channel would be the likely route of Allied invasion. So Hitler set about creating a 1,200-mile-long coastal defense system from Denmark to the Spanish-French border. It consisted really of two types of technology. One is the, the barrier to getting onto the beach, uh, anti-tank or anti-ship uh, structures that were placed in the sand and, and in the water offshore to make it very difficult to find a place where you could actually get a boat onto the beach. The next barrier was the string of heavy artillery bunkers with six-foot-thick concrete and steel reinforced walls that punctuated the cliffs. But the Allies knew that in order to retake the continent, the Atlantic Wall would have to be breached. Fortunately, General Eisenhower's D-Day landing troops employed some beach technology of their own. The bulk of the infantry came ashore in a very small boat called the Higgins boat, which had a ramp on the front that formed the bow. And as soon as they got in shallow enough water to, to ground out, they dropped the ramp, and everybody starts running for the beach. There were other landing craft, but the Higgins boat, also called LCVP for Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, was the workhorse of the amphibious fleet. Designed by Andrew Higgins, this boat was 36 feet long and could carry 36 combat-equipped soldiers or four tons of cargo from ship to shore. Its 225-horsepower engine and shallow-draft bottom, flatter than a normal V-shaped hull, allowed the boat to deliver its cargo on the beach and then quickly retract. This ability to get in and out was crucial to an operation as massive as the D-Day landing, which was the largest amphibious landing in history. Years later, President Eisenhower would call Andrew Higgins the man who won the war for us. Maybe the Higgins boat won that war, but the Navy hasn't stopped trying to improve on it. The current state of the art is the LCAT, or Landing Craft Air Cushion. Introduced in 1987, its hull never touches water or land. It is a classic hovercraft. This means that it travels over water and over land on a cushion of air. The craft is supported by a full rubber skirt. There are lift fans on board which push air into the skirt and thereby keeping the craft up on cushion. Four gas turbine engines capable of pumping 16,000 horsepower lift and propel the vehicle by forced air alone. Carrying a 60-ton payload, 15 times the capability of the Higgins boat, she can reach 70% of the world's shores, traveling at speeds of 50-plus miles an hour. At these freeway speeds, she can come up to the beach, does not have to stop at the beach, but can transverse across into firmer ground uh, less exposed. The military looks for tactical advantage in designing beach vehicles. For civilians, the name of the game is fun. Bruce Myers didn't invent the dune buggy. He just made it more enjoyable and accessible. He was the Henry Ford of dune buggies, and his Model T was the Myers Manx. In 1964, the first Manx hit the beach. Meyer's whimsical design called for a 1960s Volkswagen Beetle as its base, with one key difference. The lower chassis, or floor pan, would have to be shortened by about 14 inches. This made the buggy stouter and stronger with a tighter turning radius. But the crowning glory was the molded fiberglass body that went on top. 
This dropped the weight to a sporty 1,200 pounds and gave the Manx its distinctive look. But you couldn't buy the Manx in a store. If you came up with the VW lower half, Myers would sell you a $400 kit that included the upper half, the dashboard, hood, and body, with explicit directions on putting it all together. He sold over 6,000 of the kits and helped launch a national craze for off-road vehicles. San Francisco, 1896. Wealthy industrialist Adolf Sutro takes the beach inside. Built right on the city's rugged western shore, historic Sutro Baths was the largest indoor swimming pool ever built. It was enclosed in an enormous glass and steel structure. So you could see the weather outside. It was, in a way, a, a beach. Uh, packed into a building. Sutro filled his pools with fresh seawater that was channeled in at high tide and then fed into six swimming pools, which held over 1.8 million gallons. Incredibly, it took only an hour to fill all the tanks. Along the way, the water was heated to various temperatures for the different pools. The size of this was absolutely enormous. The whole uh, sequence of structures filled about three acres and uh, could accommodate up to 20,000 visitors in a single day. And if those visitors needed a swimsuit, they could rent one of the 20,000 the baths had available to the public. The simple black jersey one-piece was far different from what swimwear had been and what it was about to become. In the beginning, swimwear was not for swimming, it was for modesty. A flash of a woman's leg was taboo, and one would go to great lengths to keep her bathing dress down in the water. They wore weights in the hems of their garments. They had to prevent themselves from being seen. By the turn of the 20th century, heavy knee-length wool dresses with bloomers and stockings were standard. But in 1907, scandal erupted when a world champion swimmer named Annette Kellerman wore a tight-fitting one-piece suit that exposed her legs. She pioneered the first functional swimsuit that is not a bathing costume, but an actual costume in which one could move through water. For this liberating act, she was arrested for public indecency, as were many of her followers. But there was no turning back. And suddenly, manufacturers were on a search for the perfect fabric that could be both fashionable and practical. In the 20s, it was tightly knit, long-fibered wool. In the 30s, rubberized fabric called Lastex allowed for suits that fit like a second skin, but still covered enough to be modest. Then, after World War II, a bombshell. Named after the Bikini Atoll, an atomic test site in the Pacific Islands, the naval-bearing bikini shocked everyone when it was introduced in 1946. So much that it wasn't until the youth explosion of the 60s that those barely visible swimsuits were popping up everywhere. The 70s and 80s saw plenty of these revealing suits, many made from a newer synthetic called Lycra. An elastic fiber, Lycra can stretch up to five times its original shape and still fit perfectly. The latest in a long line of so-called miracle fabrics is microfiber. 100 times smaller than a human hair, microfiber resembles a pie in cross-section with many finer fibers along its entire length. Strong and light, it's a far cry from the heavy wool swimsuits of a hundred years ago. But with advances in technology, the strongest protection on the beach today is not a swimsuit at all. The chemicals in sunscreen now allow us to expose more skin than ever 
while still protecting us from the sun's cancer-causing ultraviolet rays. Beginning in the 20s, scientists made preparations of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, whose particles reflect ultraviolet rays. Developed in 1943, PABA, short for para-aminobenzoic acid, was the first organic sunscreen. Unfortunately, it would stain clothing, and many people were allergic to its chemical makeup. So today, most sunscreens are PABA-free. These modern sunscreens actually absorb UV radiation in much the same way that darker skin pigment does, by converting these UV waves to heat and then dissipating them harmlessly. Sun protection is a must for anyone at the beach, even if you're in the water, waiting for waves of another kind. Modern surfing has roots that go back hundreds of years in Hawaii. And up until the 20s and 30s, many surfboards were handmade of redwood, up to 15 feet long, and could weigh up to 200 pounds. You know, 200 pound boards were the redwood days, which was before my dad. Uh, my dad was started with balsa, and balsa is actually pretty light. In 1950, Hobie Alter, a surfer himself, began making balsa surfboards in his garage in Laguna Beach, California. He would laboriously glue the wood together and then shape it with a router that he mounted on a jig. Then he would plane it, sand it, and then have it glassed, a messy process that sealed the board with fiberglass resin. For seven years, he made surfboards this way, completing only around a dozen a week. But space-age technology was about to change everything. In 1957, a material called polyurethane foam would transform Hobie's shop and an industry. The difference there would be you could mass produce boards. Foam was like shaping a stick of butter compared to a piece of solid wood. Today, it all begins with a foam blank, which is quickly roughed out by hand and then prepared for glassing. But when demand is high, a computerized shaping machine, a direct descendant of Hobie's old router on a jig, takes care of business two at a time. The exact measurements are programmed in and the foam flies in fractions of an inch. It takes a large mass of foam and brings it down to a level where I can finish it off by hand. Even if it's, if it's rough by me or if it's rough by the machine, someone still has to come along and fine tune the board. From that point, it goes to the glasser. At the glassing shop, pigment is mixed with resin and the glasser goes to work. What they basically do is they lay a board out, um, deck down, cut fiberglass cloth over the entire board, cut it out to the basic shape of the board with a little bit of an overlap, maybe two inches, um, pour catalyzed resin on top of it and squeegee it out onto the board and make, it, make a nice tight bond between your foam and the fiberglass cloth. And then they do the same process on the top with two layers and then from there it goes on to putting a sanding coat of resin on. Then it's sanded, glossed, and then buffed to a high sheen, ready for the wave. There's a lot of boards going through the process, but every single board means something to somebody. And it's kind of neat that every board is just brings someone some little bit of happiness, and they go out and try it, and it's just, you know, continues the cycle. The sun is high, the waves are sparkling, and your eyes are killing you. You need sunglasses, but not any pair will do. Simple darkened lenses to cut out excess light have been around since the 18th century, but they did nothing to keep out the glare from harsh, reflected light. By the mid-20th century, polarized lenses were a sight for sore eyes. Before inventing instant photography, Edwin Land patented a cellophane-like polarizing filter in 1929, which made it possible to block rays of polarized light 
or light waves traveling in one direction. Today, microscopic crystals are embedded between layers of glass. The alignment of crystals are in one direction that blocks polarized light. And when you have reflected light, it's strongly polarized, meaning it's traveling in a single plane. And when you have a, a single plane of light reach the polarized lens, which has the crystals lined up in a, a, a way to block that plane of light, uh, that plane doesn't go through the lens. Sunglasses let you stay in the sun a little longer. But if you want to stay in the water longer, you'd better have a wetsuit. In the 1950s, a die-hard surfer by the name of Jack O'Neill regularly plunged into the bone-chilling 40-degree water of Northern California. Nobody could last long at those temperatures, so O'Neill began stitching together suits made of neoprene, a synthetic rubber foam used in car door seals. The idea was to insulate the wearer's core body temperature. A little water getting in was no problem, as the wearer's body heat would warm it up, or the wetsuit would eventually expel it because of the tight fit. Along the way, O'Neill also invented the comical-looking dry suit called the supersuit. Originally designed for at-sea rescues during hot air ballooning emergencies, the suit inflates with insulating air and becomes an instant life preserver. But it was the neoprene wetsuit that made it truly an endless summer. Now, people could withstand temperatures as low as 40 degrees for up to eight hours. When you're a kid, you can stay in the water a long time, and uh, so the wetsuits definitely help stay out there as long as you could until your mom yelled at you to come in. <laughs> if wetsuits have the ability to keep the cold from the warm, then coolers do just the opposite. The key as in wetsuits, is insulation. Advances in plastics during World War II gave us polystyrene, a versatile plastic resin that can be easily expanded into a lightweight yet strong foam. Everybody calls it styrofoam, although that's not accurate. Technically, styrofoam is only made by the Dow Chemical Company, which invented it and never made coolers or any other kind of containers with it. Anyway, expanded polystyrene foam is a closed cell foam, meaning that it's made up of many little beads with trapped air inside. In fact, it's over 95% air, yet it's watertight and airtight enough to keep your drinks cold. And the next step in cooler technology? How about the can that cools itself? This is the instant cool can, capable of lowering the temperature of a beverage 30 degrees in just three minutes. Simply twist the bottom to activate the cooling process. A desiccant, or moisture remover, contained within a vacuum, draws the heat from the beverage through an evaporator and then into an insulated heat sink container. It's non-toxic and recyclable, but so far no match for the popularity of expanded polystyrene foam, which seems to be everywhere on the beach, much to the dismay of people who have to clean up after it when it's not disposed of properly. It breaks up into a million pieces, and it's a maintenance nightmare. Uh, the wind comes up, it blows all over the, the uh, beach sand. Uh, it's not good for the environment, so it has an adverse impact all the way around. Foam products and every other possible kind of debris make beach maintenance along the urbanized coast of Los Angeles County a huge challenge. Of the 26 miles of beach that we operate and maintain, we have 60 million people that come down to the beach, which equates to about 4,800 ton of trash that we remove off the beach per calendar year. That can mean up to 16 tons of debris every day during the summer season. Beach technology to the rescue. To maintain our beaches, we have over 160 pieces of equipment. The agricultural tractors that we use are the same type of tractors that they use in the Midwest. With one difference, the tires have to be filled with over 100 pounds of water for extra traction on the sand. Then the four-wheel drive 16-gear tractor can tow a variety of grooming attachments. 
The barber surf rate collects the top layer of sand and flips the debris onto the tines of a conveyor belt, which then deposits it into a large hopper. But the beach sanitizer is the backbone of the fleet. It will pick up everything from cigarette filters to broken glass. And the unique thing about this piece of equipment is it's got a paddle wheel up in front here. And what that does, it takes the material on the beach and it throws the sand as well as the debris up on this wired mesh. What happens is, is that the sand will percolate through this wired mesh, goes back down to the beach, while all the debris and material will go up the wired mesh and into what we call the hopper, which is a big bucket. What we never ever want to do is to take natural sand, our beach sand, that's so precious to us, off the beach and to a landfill, but more importantly, we want to take trash to the landfill and keep our sand here along the coastline of California. So much for the trash. But what about the things of value that are left on the beach? If you're unlucky enough to lose an expensive gold watch in the sand, you might want to invest in a metal detector. In 1881, as President James Garfield lay dying from an assassin's bullet that his doctors couldn't find, no less an inventor than Alexander Graham Bell was summoned. He had developed a primitive metal detector that would make a sound when a metal object passed between two electromagnets. But the bullet was so deep, Bell's device couldn't get a reading, and Garfield eventually succumbed. The technology is still so simple that anyone can build a basic metal detector from a kit for less than $10. From there, they can get considerably more complex, but the idea remains the same. When you turn on your metal detector, you set up a field, and that field comes off of the loop that's at the end of your rod. Well, it, it is in a cone shape, and it goes down into the sand, and when you have a piece of metal unbalance that field, it's, the machine picks it up and sends a signal to your earphone, it goes beep, and they say, hey, there's a piece of metal down there, and we need to dig it. Lance has done a lot of digging in his 22 years of metal detecting, and that's added up to thousands in silver and gold. But this treasure isn't the result of luck. Lance gets up well before dawn to do research on the computer. I looked at the uh, information from the harvest buoy and the deep water swell on the internet from Scripps, and it tells me what the degree of the swell is and the intensity. By studying the live reports from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography's website, Lance knows exactly when a particular beach will get the most erosion from waves, exposing valuable metals. Then he goes to work with the latest weapon in the metal detecting arsenal, pulse induction technology. Pulse induction uh, today is, is the thing that, that's happening. It's the best. Pulse induction works by sending as many as 100 pulses of current per second into the ground. These pulses magnetize metallic objects up to 14 inches deep, which are then sensed by the machine. The technology works equally as well on dry land or in the surf. After you dug a bunch of holes and they're all bottle caps and wires, you, you learn to differentiate the sounds and like a wire or a nail is a double beep. Uh, one way you pass your loop over it. And so you say, oh, I don't want to dig that one. I know what that is but a nickel and a gold ring sound exactly the same in the sand. And when I hear a nickel, I, get, I really get excited. I think, oh man, I got a chance for a gold ring. And you get it in your scoop, and you're starting to shake the sand out, and you feel the weight of whatever the target is in the basket. And well, some, the gold rings, they feel pretty good. They go clunk, 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 and yeah, oh, all right. That's a good one. Even though they're mostly made of rock, beaches are fluid things, subject to the same waxing and waning as the tides that nourish them. Most beaches, the large waves of winter will scour a beach, and, and most beaches during the, the calmer summer months, the sand builds back up. That's a natural cycle. 
But sometimes the sea subtracts from beaches more than it adds. It's called beach erosion. And when it threatens our shorelines, agencies like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers go to work. They've been at the forefront of beach technology since their establishment as a permanent agency in 1802. One of their modern missions is beach replenishment, which can turn a narrow strip of beach into one that looks like this. The beach replenishment jobs and the maintenance dredging jobs we do places large quantities of sand on the beach. And without that sand, a lot of the beaches that we take for granted or that are there that people recreate on would just not be there. In 2001, in Redondo Beach, California, the Army Corps of Engineers, with the help of local government, renourished a badly eroded stretch of beach. Manson Construction supplied the 230-ton capacity derrick with a clamshell crane. And for five months, sand was scooped up from the bottom of the ocean and loaded onto barges. From there, the barges were tugged into position and unloaded into 40 feet of water offshore. Next, a 220-foot hydraulic dredge piped the sand onto the beach at a rate of 25,000 cubic yards a day. 80% water and 20% sand, the slurry was then moved with bulldozers, which helped push the water out and shape the final beach. When it was finished, more than 420,000 tons of clean sand had been restored to the beach. But sometimes a beach can disappear completely, practically pulling the rug out from under seaside structures. Desperate situations like these call for a different kind of beach technology, especially in the case of a beloved national landmark. Since 1870, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse was a beacon to countless ships trying to negotiate the treacherous coast off North Carolina. But a century later, the lighthouse itself was in danger. They knew they were in trouble in about 1920. Uh, of the original 1,600 feet to the ocean, uh, there only remained about 300 feet to the shore in 1920. 60 years later, the shore was down to 160 feet. So International Chimney Company was brought in to pick up the 4,800-ton lighthouse and move it to a location half a mile inland. In 1999, workers began unearthing the massive foundation, which was then replaced by a grid of steel beams. Next, 100 synchronized hydraulic jacks lifted it six feet and placed it onto a huge roller system. For 22 days, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse slowly made its way to its new home. Far away from the hazards of the unpredictable beach. Sometimes the landmark gets moved, and sometimes the beach does. At the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, Guests enjoy their very own synthetic shoreline with a twist. We have a beach in the middle of the desert here. We have 1,700 tons of sand, this is the beach area, and then 1.6 million gallons of water, which consists of the wave pool. Designed and built by Murphy's Waves of Scotland, this landlocked sea produces one breaker every 108 seconds. The system is capable of creating waves as high as 13 feet in a variety of configurations. But for safety reasons, they make them parallel to the shore and rarely over three and a half feet tall. There's 10 holding chambers that hold about 54,000 gallons of water. The water goes into the chambers and then it pushes out through the gravity and that's what makes the wave. Behind the enormous concrete facade, five 150 horsepower turbine engines capable of pumping 850,000 gallons a minute fill the huge chambers with water. But lifting the massive three-ton gates that will unleash the wave is not easy. With about 70 tons of water pressure pushing against each gate, the hardest working part of this wave machine is the lifting system. 
Each unit must first build up enough pressure before it has the power to go into action. After the wave has broken, the water spills into the surrounding drains and goes back into the 27-foot deep reservoir under the facility where it gets filtered. On the way, chlorine is automatically added, up to 1,500 gallons a week. It takes only three hours to completely clean and recycle the entire pool. But every 108 seconds, the machinery goes back to work so the people can have fun. Meanwhile, the ancient and natural machinery of sand and surf continues to chug along, as it has since our planet was young. And if indeed we did come from the ocean, then these sandy thresholds are where we, like Columbus, first encountered the rest of the world. Since then, we may have developed technologies that enhance our enjoyment of the beach, but it's doubtful we'll ever duplicate one perfectly. And maybe that's for the best. I prefer the living beach because I want my sandcastles to be built out of real sand. Technology can build a better beach if technology sets its mind to protecting, restoring, reviving those elements that have nourished our bodies and our souls and our spirits. If the past is any indication, technology will continue to make beaches safer, cleaner, and more hospitable to the people who leave their footprints on them.